I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Today we consider American electoral politics in our 2018 state and federal elections. By an overwhelming majority in the popular vote, the nation sought to restore democratic accountability. But that may not be possible across the Midwest where GOP, gerrymandered majority legislatures are removing the powers of newly elected Democratic governors. What Republicans are doing in Wisconsin, Michigan, and North Carolina, too, is the stuff of third world regimes. There's no mistaking it. Republican leadership seem intent on executing the very soul of our democracy, negating we the people. And let's not forget, too, that in two presidential elections within the last 20 years, the majority vote were denied representation in the White House. The national popular vote campaign of states pledges to honor the will of the majority in our electoral college. And today to discuss that and other electoral matters is Pam Wilmot, Electoral Reform Director for Common Cause and Executive Director of Common Cause, Massachusetts. Thank you for being here, Pam. Thank you for having me. What is the status of the national popular vote today? How many states are signed on? How many states need to be signed on in order for that pact to rule at the end of the day so that the candidate with the popular vote will win the election? So national popular vote is a, is a state-based plan to guarantee the election to the popular vote winner in all 50 states. And we currently have, uh, the plan has passed in 12 different states, three, uh, four small states, actually three um, plus DC, which has three electoral votes, um, four medium-sized states, and four big states, including your home state here of New York um, and surrounding states. So um, we have, that makes for 172 electoral votes out of the 270 that are required for the plan to become effective. Nothing is uh, changed right now for the states that have passed this plan. It only triggers when we get 98 more electoral states representing 98 more electoral votes. You're more uh, than halfway there. We're about two thirds. Right. So uh, it's actually uh, been doing great. Um, I have been working in the field of elect election reform for uh, many years, uh, more than I care to say. Um, and uh, change is hard. I worked on early voting in Massachusetts for uh, probably, it's been around for 30 years and finally passed um, not uh, a couple years ago and, and had, its, uh, had its, its second trial this, this fall. Actually, I know New York is still considering that. Um, there are many election reforms that just take a long time, and that's partially because our elected officials are used to the current system. Uh, the national popular vote is something that Americans have preferred, they want, uh, and Gallup has been polling on it for uh, since the 50s, and it always has huge support in the populace. It's also the most feasible way, unlike a constitutional amendment, to enact a change that would um, force the Electoral College to respect the majority vote. That is absolutely true. And let's be clear, why are we in the current situation that we are where uh, three quarters of the states are ignored in the presidential election? We have a handful of battleground states where uh, all of the money and the visits go. We all know their names. Uh, they do shift slightly over time, but Florida, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and then a smattering of others, sometimes Wisconsin, sometimes not, sometimes. Uh, but those core states are where the election takes place. And the reason is because of their winner-take-all rules combined with the setup of the Electoral College. Uh, Winner-take-all is not in the Constitution, so it doesn't need to be changed by a constitutional amendment. States can do that right now. My home state of Massachusetts has changed the way we've awarded electors 11 different times. Um, two states do it by district allocation. That's Maine and Nebraska. Um, so uh, a constitutional amendment is very, it, it takes a, a very long time to do and to undo. 
Uh, and this retains the power in the states to maintain how we elect a president, which is appropriate. In what states is this legislation pending and up for debate and possibly votes in 2019? 2019, we'll see introductions in many different states. Uh, I, we don't have the full list at the moment, um, but it has passed in 11, in addition to the 12 that have fully enacted the legislation, 11 other states have, it has passed one chamber. Uh, and some of those that I think you'll see again are Oregon, where it has passed over and over again in one chamber, Maine, uh, Delaware, um, uh, uh, Colorado, New Mexico, uh, Nevada. There's a whole long list. Arkansas, Arizona. Um, we're, you know, the sky's the limit. I think that people are very interested in this reform at the moment, um, given the fact that we've had many close presidential elections uh, and, and the outcome. I think one thing that's important to remember is this isn't about helping one political party or another political party, despite what some might think. This is a good, strong, uh, democratic, small d, not a big day, reform, because it will make every vote count in every state, as opposed to the small little uh, pressure cooker that we have in the small number of places. I think people don't realize how little attention most states get in this whole process. I am more hopeful than you, Pam, that in 2020, there will be an expanded field of so-called battlegrounds. Uh, I think we might be surprised in reaction to Donald Trump's presidency. I'm not saying Alabama and Mississippi are going to be turf for the Democrats to compete, but there are states, uh, Texas, Georgia, Arizona, maybe even the Northwest in, more expansively than Oregon and Washington that are competitive. Even looking back for 20 years, uh, 98, somewhere in between 94 and 98 percent of the money and visits are spent in just 12 states. Oh, I This agree. is a consistent, yeah. I, I'm not saying it's going to be three states. Sure. Maybe it will be a slightly expanded field. In fact, uh, 2016 was a slightly different map than 2012. Sure. Um, but the fact remains that uh, two-thirds of the state gets either gets zero visits and zero money. Right. And then we've also looked at, as you go into governing, how sitting presidents tend to favor those states sure. where, uh, you know, a small number of votes can flip an entire election. Your work, the national popular vote and its passage, is dependent upon, contingent upon, um, legislatures. In this case, the Democrats are the party that favor this more than the Republicans. So Democratic legislatures, Democratic governors who will sign rather than Republican governors who might veto uh, that kind of legislation. There's a lot of misinformation out both in the public and in the legislature. I think everyone remembers their civics course from grade school <laughs> and a lot of the information they got was wrong. And so uh, having, overcoming some of that is important. We've also learned that we need to talk to everyone. Uh, small one-on-one -on -one conversations really help to make a huge difference. Having validators from both sides of the aisle, this isn't actually just, isn't a republic, I mean, the numbers in terms of polling are significantly different between the two sides. And, but we do have uh, many dedicated Republicans who are strongly supportive of this. Uh, we have Republicans on the National Popular Vote Board, uh, endorsers including Newt Gingrich and uh, Tom Sanicandro and uh, uh, Jake, former Senator Jake Garn, all sorts of folks, and then also those who are in the trenches currently and going out to states and promoting it as well. So we try to talk to folks on both sides of the aisle to kind of tamp down some of the Republican knee-jerk opposition, because sometimes when they think about it, they realize actually the system doesn't really benefit us. And that's why we passed uh, the Oregon, um, the Oregon, the uh, Oklahoma Senate 
We passed the Arizona House, both very red chambers. We were set up for victories in many other states until certain prominent Republicans decided that it wasn't something they wanted to see. And we're still kind of overcoming those obstacles. The re prominent Republicans who thought what you're not saying is they thought it would be disadvantageous to their long-term political trajectory, that their, their ability to hold on to power. Is, isn't that the crux of their resistance? Yeah, probably. Let's talk um, about... But they, yeah. You know, because I think there really rationally aren't great reasons against a popular vote. Uh, a popular vote is something that every other election in the country and pretty close to the world when it comes to democratic elections are elected by. Right. Um, other people in other parts of the world think we are crazy to right. have the system that we have. Um, and as you say, in civics classrooms, you come to understand the Electoral College not as the popular vote. You come to understand it in the way that it's been practiced, which is you got to win enough states to reach that threshold. So, so some of the misinformation is that small states benefit from the Electoral College and the current system. They don't benefit. There are 12 small states. Um, half of them are Democratic, half of them Republican. Only one, New Hampshire, is a battleground state. Only one, New Hampshire, and this time around Maine, because of their district system, got any kind of attention in the presidential election. Compare that to Ohio, which has roughly the equal population of those states. And Ohio has, uh, depending on the election, 60 visits in a short uh, window in the fall um, and uh, millions and millions and millions of dollars of investment. Let's review more broadly trends in 2018. Okay. Automatic voter registration, ranked choice voting, um, early voting. There are obstacles now, um, some of which have been signed into law in, towards the end in the lame duck session of Republican, outgoing Republican terms to abridge or truncate uh, the duration of early voting. Um, why can't we have automatic voter registration in every single state? And so. It is one kind of election reform that is more bipartisan than some of the others. And there are reasons why Republicans like it and there are reasons why Democrats like it and they tend to be different reasons. But the reform combines both adding more accuracy and security to the system, which is something the Republicans tend to be drawn to, and it's something that it registered more voters, which is something the Democrats are on. And both are good goals. I mean, we want to have, uh, as, as someone who, who tends more to the progressive spectrum, uh, we, I think that we all want more accurate and secure elections. We just don't want more accurate and secure elections at the expense of voter involvement or as an excuse for suppressing the vote, which sometimes it has been used. But automatic voter registration is a legitimate way of accomplishing both goals at the same time. Uh, we have passed 15 states already and are on track to get, getting to about half of them by 2020. Uh, Republican states uh, on the ballot, it won in Alaska and in Michigan and, and in uh, you know, a number of states on the ballot, Nevada, um, but it will uh, it's been introduced by Republicans as well as Democrats. It is going to be introduced in Congress. Um, it has been for this session coming up. Uh, so I think we have a good shot for that reform, particularly. And does it technically mean something different in each state, or is it essentially the same in each state, the way that it actually works? There are slight differences on how you decline to register to vote. So both the, the, the system essentially means that you go from an opt-in system where you have to do something affirmative right. to where you have to opt out. So how that opt-out system works is slightly different for each state. Um, how does the opt-in work, though, in effect, when you turn 18? So currently, if you or go... The, or, or I should say, not opt-in. How does the automatic process... Okay. How do you learn of the automatic process? So in Massachusetts and Oregon and in Alaska and uh, maybe a few more states as we're heading toward this, you go to a covered agency. You 
provide information about and proof that you're a, a citizen and that you're of the correct age and then you're registered to the vote. And then you get, if you don't want to, uh, to be a registered voter, you'll have to do an extra step uh, through the mail. You'll get a postcard and then you have to send that back. So you have to affirmatively take a step. Uh, in Alaska, it's actually tied to the dividend, the oil dividend that they get. Um, in some of the other automatic states, they have an opportunity right there at the agency to decline. So how that all works is a little bit different. It's either after the fact through uh, a mail, through a mailer, or at the agency itself. When you turn 18, you're not in the automatic system able to go to the poll the next day and vote. No. It's still a process, so it's not right. exactly automatic in the sense that you're mailed something six months before you turn 18 to remind you that you're now registered. Right? There's it, still a registration even yes. in automatic registration. That is true. That is true. What is uh, the closest is to most seamless in that sense of it's like your selective service card and that you just know you can. So we don't have a national voter database. Voters are uh, registered by state. Right. But to I was do that kind of process you're suggesting would a, have to be some sort of national process that would have to pass at the national level. We'd have to do a lot of different changes. I'm not saying that's not a goal. Many other um, countries do that. Uh, it's part of their, you know, your right as a citizen in that country. You don't have to make an extra step. But that's not how our election administration system works. I think the most seamless would be um, Massachusetts or Oregon or, or uh, Alaska currently. I think more states will be moving in that direction. We have not uh, implemented our law, Oregon has, uh, Massachusetts won't be implementing until 2020. But you do think that the states would be allowed under current federal law to send reminders in effect to folks so that they know what they need to do if they are automatically registered. So six so months... So they don't have to do anything. If but would it be a good thing if they did? Uh, if, they, if they kind of alerted folks, you know, you are about to become eligible to vote. That is actually something uh, that, that is done as part of some of uh, the Electronic Registration Information Center states. Mm -hmm. So it requires, there's about, uh, I think, 26 states that are now part of ERIC. This is the good guy answer to cross-check. Uh, but one of the components is that it, the states that are part of this agreement must send such an email mm -hmm. to or a letter to every eligible citizen, uh, whether you turn 18, whether you move into the state, uh, and say, here's how you register to vote. Automatic voter registration is a little bit different. That's where you get registered when you interact with a, uh, a certain government agency like the RMV. Uh, or DMV in most states, or uh, a health care agency. So in Massachusetts, the, the Medicaid office and also the, the, the health care market, the connector, is also part of it. So if you, if you get health care through the state, whether it's private pay or, or public pay, you will be automatically registered to vote unless you decline through that postcard at the end. So we want to opt and we want to continue that Mm -hmm. uh, voluntary process so that people can opt out uh, and that is uh, that I, we think that's important. Is there anything preventing cities when it comes to local issues from adopting a, a, a some kind of automatic system? It depends yes there is in many states uh, there's a preemption at the at the state or the county level um, some places a county might be able to do it. Most places a city couldn't do it. It um, just occurs to me, you notice yeah. that we're here recording this in New York City, which has really dismal voter turnout for municipal elections. And it's occurred to me, why, why can't the mayor, in effect, right. start his own process or mayors in other cities where turnout is too low? Well, one of the reasons that turnout is so low in city elections is they tend to be at different times than all the other right. elections. It, it's pretty clear in the U.S. that we have too many elections for the people to really 
focus on and, and, and pay attention. That doesn't mean we need less elective offices, although that may be the case. I think, for example, in my own state, uh, register of probate or clerk of courts, those are administrative positions. Those are not representative positions. They should not be elected. There's no accountability. It's, um, mm -hmm. it, it really makes no sense. But if you can combine them mm -hmm. on one day, on an even numbered year, you're going to get a lot higher participation rate than if you have, like we have town elections sure. in the spring, uh, city elections in the odd year, state elections on one even year and presidentials on sure. another. So, What do you think are the next steps forward for uh, expanding enfranchisement and voter turnout? Well, I, I think national popular vote is a critical issue uh, and is, we're going to be seeing making, making some changes. Automatic voter registration is, a, is uh, we've talked about both of those. Those are great. Um, ensuring, protecting, expanding early voting periods has been shown to make a big difference. Some states eventually go to a mail in, all mail-in ballot like uh, Oregon, Colorado. Washington, and now Colorado. And that's where the state actually mails you a ballot. Right. And then you can turn them back at a certain vote center so that it, 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 there, there is still some of that civic uh, festival sort of atmosphere as they, we have on the polls. I'm, I'm, I'm rather attached to that myself. But having that, that all has been shown to increase participation more yeah. than almost anything. Election day registration is another reform. Um, all of these things are all good. I think you see some advances, some retreats, uh, but where voters do like them, it has been hard to repeal. So, for example, in some of the states that, with a ballot initiative process, they've tried to repeal uh, election day registration and then the voters have reinstated it. In two states that you identified, decisive battlegrounds, Florida and Ohio, they've done everything to disenfranchise folks. In Ohio, they've taken folks off the rolls if they don't vote. So you don't have a right not to vote anymore. Otherwise, you're out of town if you don't respond to the government because you, vote, you didn't vote in two or three subsequent elections. In Florida, we saw what happened with the screwy process they have there with this most recent Senate and gubernatorial race. Is there any hope for Ohio and or Florida? Absolutely. So, for example, <laughs> Florida, the voters, just the same election, uh, adopted giving back voting rights to people who are convicted of a felony. Voters in both of those states um, voted for some form of redistricting reform. Um, so as, you know, redistricting is another critical, critical issue, uh, as those uh, restrictions are put, I think you'll see more representative government in both of those states. Well, you give us some hope in, in thinking about that. I, my concern would be for those newly enfranchised, former, formerly incarcerated people, because folks who are already registered have a hard time voting in Florida. True. Ballot design. Um, I mean, it sounds like sort of a confluence of per perfect storms that always plague that state. Well, part of the reason why it does, again, is because so much rides on their vote. They're one of those few states where the number of Republicans and Democrats are almost equally balanced, and suppressing a few votes can make a huge difference to the outcome. Now, if you, on the other side, they say, oh, well, then you're, in, in, you know, you're making people vote illegally. But if you vote illegally, you go to jail. <laughs> um, and the only, you know, we have just never seen the kind of uh, fraud that is, uh, is sort of the bugaboo out there. We do see uh, absentee ballots stolen and filled out or collected and filled out or, you know, that there is not like there isn't any kind of fraud, but the kind that they're trying to suppress is not the kind that happens. But the purging in Ohio yes. of voters, has there been any response? Because the Supreme Court upheld that. So what can be the response more deliberately when you see tens of thousands of voters thrown off the rolls? So they can be re-registered. Uh, you can go through an automatic voter registration process. Just 
So Ohio's process is they send out a card, and if you don't return it, um, you and then you don't vote for four years, then you are removed from the roll. So it isn't like it happened in a blink of an instant. Um, groups uh, who are on on the ground can get more people out to participate. So we can re-register those people, and that is happening. Mm -hmm. um, people who have been removed are being reached out to and getting re-engaged in the process. I think one of the other things we can do is look at campaign finance reform and just the overall general discourse, because people are very turned off by uh, by politics and how nasty it is. And that's not also not without uh, intent uh, <laughs> because um, there is, I think it's a very intentional campaign to turn people off and to tune them out. Well, thank you, Pam, for this really informative exchange. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.